Hey everyone, Eric Watson here, freelance writer, player of games, writer of words, recorder of videos, and tabletop role-playing aficionado. Welcome to another Roll20 review, my written and video review series where I take a look at the marketplace section of online role-playing website Roll20.net. This video I'll be reviewing Empire of the Ghouls, designed by Cobalt Press and adapted to Roll20. A review copy has been provided for the purposes of this review. If you enjoy my videos, consider supporting me via patreon.com slash roguewatson. Shoutouts to my platinum patrons, Andrew, Joe, Will, Tiny Dancer, Nick, Andy, Chris, Manuel, and Basil. And gold patrons, RPG Papercrafts, Charming Grenade, Pretty Boy, Yuma, Mark Hilstead, Vicente, Gilberto, Sean, AK, Cert, to be Adam, Death is Lounge, Sam, Arash, Lumpy Spuds, and Jerome. Thank you all very much for your support. So I actually do have some familiarity with Cobalt Press. Empire of the Ghouls uh, was a successful Kickstarter campaign, I believe, that funded last year and released earlier this year in hardcover and digital format. Now it is available on things like Fantasy Grounds and Roll20. So this is specifically going to be a review of Empire of the Ghouls as it appears in Roll20. So I'm reviewing the Roll20 adaptation, but I will also discuss the actual uh, campaign itself because it is very new. I'm also going to be covering what is technically the Empire of the Ghouls complete bundle which includes the Underworld Player's Guide as well as the Underworld Layers. I'm primarily going to focus this review on the actual module, Empire of the Ghouls, which can be purchased separately for $39.99, but I will cover all of the things that are included in the Complete Bundle, which is $59.99, which includes the Player's Guide and the Underworld Layers. So I will go over all of that. Um, in terms of my history with Cobalt Press, I uh, I actually backed their original Tomb of Beasts, which is this gigantic monster manual type uh, tome full of monsters uh, years ago, including a, a, a book of layers, which included a bunch of kind of one-shot dungeon crawls that were just basically dungeons uh, mapped out kind of room to room, and that was the whole, you know, that's it's not really an adventure, but it's also more than an encounter. It's just a, you know, single dungeon crawl. Uh, I also actually even reviewed, in fact, on this channel, things like uh, Prepared 2, and I believe they did the Warlock uh, E-Zine as well. So I've, I've covered some Cobalt Press stuff in the past. I think there was another Roll20. Uh, was Cat and Mouse? Was that Cobalt Press? It's kind of all swirling together. But, I mean, primarily, obviously, I've, I've covered Wizards of the Coast official modules, so it's fun to get a chance to cover things that are still using the 5th edition rules, which is what this is. This is uh, 5e. But it's just not officially D&D 5e. What that means is this uses the OGL, the Open Gaming License, which people can use the rules for D&D 5e, but just none of the actual official uh, like characters and map and setting. You, know, you can't use like Forgotten Realms. Uh, and a lot of the artwork, well, all of the artwork that's basically in the Monster Manual, you can't use any of that. So... You get to use the rules, you know, the, you can build character sheets like that. Obviously, you can make your own characters, you can make your own world. And in the case of Cobalt Press, they have their own world called Midgard, which at this point, my history of Cobalt Press is a bit fuzzy because I'm not sure how long that world has existed. But it's been around for a while, and it is a humongous world. I actually have on, my, on one of my other monitors... Uh, a giant cool interactive map of Midgard that I used for this campaign because this campaign, despite the title and the cover art, don't judge something by its cover, most of it does not take place in the Underworld, which is, of course, the is Midgard's Underdark. Midgard is basically the Forgotten Realms, but like Remix, like everything's different situation. In terms of like the tech level and the magic and the theming, it's essentially the Forgotten Realms, but it allows Cobalt Press to, you know, make up all their own stuff and their own, you know, empires and politics and regions and all those things and history, which is which is good. I don't want to. I'm not trying to talk shit about anything, but that's just kind of what you're getting. Um, but really, what this offers is a grand tour of Midgard. It's the entire campaign is made up of six individual chapters. Which, if you have played any of Paizo's Adventure Paths, it's pretty much designed exactly like that. So for those of you that aren't familiar, for Pathfinder and now for Starfinder, Paizo releases these uh, adventure paths with individual scenarios, I guess you could call them, that make up an overarching campaign. And usually these adventure paths, I believe, are about six 
uh, of these scenarios long and they they are designed you know you start at first level and by the end of the first one you're at third level and you start the second one you're at third level and then you get to fifth level it's pretty similar to that but each one of these is designed to have a beginning middle and end so they kind of all feel like individual uh, you know very small campaigns within localized areas but then there's always this overarching campaign that you're working towards this big bad or something and it, it's not a bad way to structure you know a campaign obviously it's been very successful for Paizo for years now dating back to uh, gosh I don't know the two you know the uh, mid 2000s or whenever that started up as kind of a spin-off of of D and D, and uh, Cobalt Press is is doing that as well with Empire of the Ghouls, except Empire of the Ghouls is actually released as a full campaign. It's just that each chapter is one of those individual adventures. So the advantage is they're fun to run each of those individual chapters. The disadvantage is there might be a bit of a disconnect between what you're doing in one chapter versus what you're doing in another chapter. And in the case of the overall theme, and I realize I'm kind of rambling, but I want to get this point across in the beginning. It really... You don't go into the underworld until chapter 5 of 6 chapters. So for a big chunk of this campaign, you are just running around the surface world of Midgard doing interesting stuff. And it, it, it's really a, a tour de force of Midgard. You're going, you're in the free city of Zobek, and then you're traveling around this grand duchy area of the vampire-controlled lands... Uh, and then you're up in the northern frost dealing with these, like, Amazon-like shield maidens. And then you're teleported down to this desert city in Necropolis dealing with this, you know, risen uh, ghoul king. Like, it's it really, you're just hopping along, and it's almost like the designers are like, we really want to show off Midgard in the best way possible and do all these cool exotic locations. And then wrap it up in this ending, which also is another exotic location, which is the underworld in this ghoul city. And they provide all of this cool politics and interesting stuff about this ghoul empire, which is a really neat, unique thing that separates uh, Midgard and Cobalt Press's world from, uh, like, Forgotten Realms, because I don't think the Forgotten Realms has anything like that. You know, they have the drow, um, and they have a bunch of cities of, you know, Darrow and Dwerger and all that, but they don't have a big, like, undead nation. And... Midgard has several of them. There's a vampire nation and there's a ghoul nation. And this one actually involves both of them. And then it culminates in the in the cool-ass underground uh, city. And there's all these cool politics. And they've, you know, got shadow of, of you know, flesh slaves and all that. It's, it's really well done. But it's not till the very, very end. So if you're expecting to really get a cool deep dive into that, which there is a gazetteer included here, which includes all that information... They really bury the lead, and you don't even get to really deal with the actual politics of the ghoul city and everything until basically that final chapter, which that final chapter is really cool because of that. So I was a little disappointed in that because I was excited, you know, based on the cover art and all of these things, and I knew that uh, Midgard had their own Darakul based on, you know, a lot of the, the Tomb of Beasts and stuff that I had read. So it, it's it was a little disappointing in that respect, but I still enjoyed the campaign. It's got really good maps. Um... And, well, let, let's just go over it right now before I ramble anymore, because here's you, you're going to want the stat breakdown at the beginning. So, again, Empire of the Ghouls, the complete bundle, which is $59.99, includes the Empire of the Ghouls module, which the Empire of the Ghouls module is a level 1 through 13 campaign. It says 1 to 13. I think it's technically 1 through 12, because I think it literally mentions you make level 13 after you complete the campaign. So, yeah, I don't think you're ever actually 13. So... That is a bit of a bummer that, unfortunately, that's that's a trend that I don't want to have designers do, which is copy the 1 to 12 thing that Wizards keeps doing. You know, have the guts to get us a little bit higher. Like, I think that would be enjoyable. Go a little bit deeper, get up there to at least level 15 or something. I would like to see that. But instead, it's basically a level 1 through 12 campaign divided into six chapters. We get 21 battle maps, all of them with correct 5-foot square grids, tokens, and dynamic lighting for Roll20 subscribers. Huge thumbs up. This is the modern age. Everything produced at this point should be five foot square battle maps. No excuses. And that's what we get, which is good. We get five region maps, which these are like city maps or something which aren't designed to be battle, but you still have a, a giant map for. Over 300 monsters with linked character sheets and tokens. Over 40 named NPCs with linked character sheets and tokens. Over 70 magic item handouts. And the Underworld Gazetteer, which provides details of the Ghoul Imperium. Although, honestly, it kind of sucks that we don't get anything about Midgard. And it even says, hey, here's the section. Read this first. What do I need to run the adventure? 
And it says, to run the adventure optimally, we recommend using the Midgard World Book and Midgard Heroes World Book, the Zobet Gazetteer, and the Underworld Player's Guide. Well, guess what? Only the Underworld Player's Guide is the one that's actually included, and that's only if you get the full bundle. All the other things, hope, hopefully you've already got them. Otherwise, you might be struggling if your players are really into the Midgard region, which it does mention, hey, well, it in fact mentions the same thing. You don't need to run this in Midgard. This adventure can be set in any world, here's the funny part, that contains an underground nation of ghouls, an above-ground territory belonging to vampires, a mountainous area ruled by dwarves, a cold temperate wetland, and a desert. <laughs> it's very, very much set in Midgard, for better or for worse. The better part is, it does a cool job of showing off Midgard, showing all these cool locations, and using that established lore. The bad news is, it's very hard to separate this campaign from that setting so if you really wanted to hack into this and be like okay i like the ideas here but can i put this in the forgotten realms because my players are kind of married to the forgotten realms i mean you could but you would have to hack it to death because it it really is ingrained really hard into that region but on the other hand we don't also get the background information on that stuff and i really wish we could have included some gazetteers on the actual locations we'll be in because although the underworld gazetteer is great again we're not in that underworld until chapter freaking five Anyway, um, we so if you get the bundle, so that's all Empire of the Ghouls, $39.99. If you want to get the bundle, then that includes the Underworld Layers and Underworld Players Guide. Underworld Layers can be purchased separately for $18.99. And it makes no sense to purchase them separately because it's the same price as the bundle. So it's only worth paying that price if you just want the Underground Layers and the, or sorry, Underworld Layers. The Underworld layers include 14 single dungeon adventures, although I use the, dun the term adventure very loosely, ranging from 3rd to 15th level. If you've purchased any of Cobalt Press's previous layer books, Book of Layers, Prepared, Prepared to, any of those kind of things, it is exactly like that, where it is a full dungeon map, and then it just, you know, itemizes everything about here's what's in this room, here's what's in this room. There's a little bit of an adventure hook, but 90% of the adventure hooks are like, you stumble upon this dungeon and decide to clear it out. You know, it's it's not really an adventure hook. And it doesn't really have much of a conclusion. So they're designed to be drop-in dungeons. I think they're very well done. I'll, I'll show you a few as an example. And they are add-ons to where you can add them to any existing campaign, including this one. Um, but any of your Roll20 campaigns, you literally do that drop-down menu and you select, you know, I'm going to add this one on there. And they're all in, and, and you, don't, you don't even add all 14 of them, each one is an individual uh, add-on that you can uh, add individually. So, like, I've only added three in here to give you an example, which I will uh, after I cover Empire of the Ghouls, but that's a nice thing to have. Um, and then the Underworld Player's Guide, which I think you only get if you purchase the bundle, includes 12 new subclasses, 8 new races, 3 new backgrounds, and there's kind of a, a smattering of new, uh, like, spells and some lore and things, but... Basically only useful if your players are really going to be into wanting to play some of these new exotic underworld races. But again, like even if they want to play a Darakul or a Dampir or um, what are the other options? Uh, in fact, I've got it right here. Underworld Player's Guide. This is what it looks like, by the way. It's just in the uh, Roll20 compendium. You just search for it. Um, and all of these are links. You can just click on these. Uh, Trollkin, you can actually play a Darrow, a Drow. A lot of these have been added in other D&D expanded things, I believe. Um, but, as I said, you don't actually get to the Underworld until way later in the campaign, so it would still be very problematic for a player to actually play one of these monstrous races for most of the campaign. The subclasses, though, are very cool. They do a good job of uh, expanding that flavor of this darkness rising. I especially love the Monk Way of Sated. Hunger, which is only available for a dark cool or a damp here, and you literally meditate your desire to like eat people away, and then you, you gain some other powers from that. So I think that's that's pretty cool. But uh, I'm very thumbs up on this entire Underworld Player's Guide, but only if you're actually going to want to obviously play as uh, this new content uh, via Roll20. That's the only time it becomes useful. All right, so let's cover the Empire of the Ghouls. Um, we're going to go over the chapters kind of briefly. I really want to try to keep this video in a decent runtime. Um, and I'll show you the maps and kind of what it's all about. The first thing we're probably going to look at, though, is one of my biggest complaints of the module. Uh, and that's this can be found in the alphabetized token page. And this is a consequence of the OGL, which is the Open Gaming License, versus 
having it be by Wizards of the Coast or, you know, folks that produce stuff on the DM's Guild, which means Wizards takes half of your <laughs> of your money when you sell it there because you're using their stuff. So if you use the OGL, if you're releasing something on Drive Through RPG or whatever else you want to use, you don't get to use the artwork that Wizards has produced. What that means is every single creature that appears in the monster manual is not given art tokens in Empire of the Ghouls, which you can see that right here on this page. Now what Roll20 has done, which I kind of do appreciate, previously, and if you've seen any, any of my other Roll20 reviews, if Roll20 does not have art for that token, which happens for a lot of like unique creatures or variant creatures, where uh, you know it was a new creature that was introduced in the book, for example, but didn't have art, which happened, you know, not every single thing has art, then they will just have a blank token with that creature's name written across the token. It looks super stupid. I've complained about it for years <laughs> that I've been doing these reviews. And finally, this is the first one I've seen that gets rid of that and replaces it with this kind of generic icon that I guess is kind of a, a symbol of the ghouls or maybe like a symbol of the entire module. That's not a bad idea. That's it's it's better than words. I'll give them that. If you're gonna use a generic token, you know, and I'm picturing if you're at the table of the generic token, I don't know, you're putting like a dice there or something, you know, just some abstract thing, and this is supposed to replace that. The bummer is, as you can see, there are a lot of creatures with these tokens that do not have token art. Now they do have all the proper linked character sheets. So I just shift, I think I shift double clicked it right, double clicked right there. And that brings up the bio and info and the character sheet. All of this is linked and ready to go. And you can also drag them from the journal, drag them onto the sheet like here. And it's immediately ready to go. It's got hit points ready. It's got, this is the armor class and you've got this token ready. That's an amazing thing. It's a huge plus to buying anything on roll 20 is you get all of these tokens, all of these character sheets already set up. There is nothing stopping you from making all of this yourself, which is one of the big advantages to Roll20. This shit is all free if you want it to be free, but uh, you know a lot of us will pay the money if it means saving time, and this saves you a lot of time. The bummer is none of this comes with art. Now, if you own the Monster Manual on Roll20, you can buy the Monster Manual via Roll20. I don't know how much it is off the top of my head because... And the prices actually do change and go down after time. Um, which means I should probably stop announcing how much these things are when I do my review because after the fact, <laughs> the prices do go down uh, now that I think about it. If you own the monster manual, you can go to your compendium, search for that monster. I don't unfortunately actually have the monster manual. I've got, I think, all the other ones. Uh, drag that thing in here. I've got, you can see I've got Mordenkainen's Tomb of Foes. So if I were to drag this one in here, yes, thank you. Um, I believe it should have spawned that somewhere in here. There it goes. Okay, right there. That one is the same thing as dragging it from the journal. But obviously this one has the token art already, everything in place. So you can circumvent this issue if you own the monster manual. If you own the monster manual, it adds all of the monsters with token art. You're essentially buying all of those, all of that art, tokens, and everything in your compendium. And you could use the take up the arduous task of deleting these tokens and dragging them from the monster manual. Notice, however, these actually have a cool purple outline with everything in this module. And other ones have this kind of orangey yellow one. So your tokens would look a little bit different. If you wanted to really go through the, you could probably try to recreate the tokens, all of that. That's extra work. Again, it sucks to buy a module, spend real money, and then have extra work there. So I feel for you. And I hate that so many of these tokens don't have token art. Now, anything that's a new monster that Cobalt Press created, including a lot of creatures that are found in the Tomb of Beasts, have that artwork because it's by Cobalt Press. So all of those have the art, which is awesome. And unfortunately, it starts off with the campaign. You're fighting a lot of mundane stuff. You know, you're you're not fighting all these cool underworld creatures. You're level freaking one, you're in the city. So the beginning of the module, it's more egregious with a lot of these tokens versus the end of the module where you're fighting all of these unique 
ghoul and underworld creatures which have tokens. So a big complaint I have is that a a huge chunk of the monsters found in here, I didn't do the math, but just by glancing at it, I want to say maybe a third of the tokens don't have token art. And that's a big bummer. And there are over 300, which is on the higher end of tokens. So it sucks. It's it's not Roll20's fault. And in fact, I think Roll20 made the right call in at least giving us a picture instead of giving us words. But it's a consequence of anything that uses the OGL. And But you still want to play on a virtual tabletop that uses the art. You can't have that. So... You can get around that by getting the monster manual and moving your tokens over. That's a little bit of a workaround. Uh, but unfortunately, that's that's how it is with a lot of these tokens. So that's a big complaint I have is that you're not going to have token art on all these things versus if you actually bought something that was officially Wizards of the Coast. You should have token art on all of the generic creatures and only missing some of the named creatures. Interestingly enough, because we do have art on all the specific Cobalt Press creatures, you can see here the named NPCs we have pictures on almost all of them because these are the ones that are specific characters that have uh, official artwork or they're special unique creatures like this uh, really badass like CR-10 Achiug that you end up fighting in this pit in chapter 5, I think. So that's a bit of a bummer. But the maps. The maps are pretty good. Pretty good, I say. They're actually pretty damn good because so many of the maps that rolled, that Wizards of the Coast has produced lately, I, ha I have not been a fan of it all. If you've been watching my reviews of the last about two years or so, they've started shifting their cartography and their maps into a more abstracted uh, graph paper looking design, which a lot of people have nostalgia for. I do not. I like really nice looking battle maps because I primarily play on <laughs> never fails the wife calls me in the middle of review <laughs> I like to play on virtual tabletops I use roll 20 for everything and I like having good battle maps like this so you can see all the tokens are in place I can switch to, net to dynamic lighting and all of these provide sight blocking light sources all give off proper amounts of light it all works out well, and it looks good. So we get a lot of really nice battle maps and good region maps, although even then, um, it probably could have used a few more region maps because we go around to so many regions in this campaign. Uh, I mean, we're missing, like... I don't think we have the city of Seawall, uh, which is the uh, desert city. We do get the uh, Vendic Vendicul, which is the uh, cool... Ghoul Empire City at the end. Um, but we're missing a lot of... Excuse me, I had a monstrous sneeze. I'm all better now. Uh, it is missing a few region maps. Uh, Jost, I think, is one of the more... This is definitely not my... These are more abstracted region maps. These are not the beautiful uh, ones that you might find in other campaigns but the battle maps and I don't think they're scaled correctly either um, I can give kind of just a brief tour of are, are really good looking like they're detailed they've got color they've got light um, I'm, I'm a fan like thumbs up because and I, and I'm so starved for for maps too you can see here here's an example of what it looks like when you have like one token art and the rest none of it is token art which I don't understand why Roll20 can't just use a generic I mean, surely they've got one, right? They've got like a generic just person image that they could have used. Here. I don't know. Maybe not. I don't. It, it's it's it bugs the crap out of me that, that they we have to rely on all these kind of symbols to, to really abstract the art. But you can see here, especially in the in the early level, this is the uh, the final dungeon of the first chapter. Um, it's it's a lot more egregious. All right. So chapter one starts off really fun. Players are hired as bodyguard bodyguards for a kobold accused of, of kidnapping somebody uh, in the free city of Zobek. Starts out in, in Zobek. Um, and the investigation leads the players, and there's a bunch of tasks they can do to protect. And it, there's a whole, like, uh, like racism angle you can deal with, too, where they're, like, a bunch of people, like, throwing bricks into this tavern to attack the poor kobold and all that. And it does mention kind of a, a content one at the beginning where it's like, hey, you know, you can take this as far or eliminate it as much as you want because these are obviously real-world shit that a lot of players aren't going to want to 
tangle with, which is very understandable. Um, it eventually leads to a basically a BDSM cult under the city that hides a uh, kind of a this sinister burgeoning plot between uh, the Ghoul Empire and the Vampire Empire. And they're trying to kind of uh, negotiate some kind of alliance system. And the Ghouls are usually there. There's this whole Ghoul Empire, but they're pretty keen on staying below ground. So that's cause for trepidation there. So the entire first arc, which is for first and second level players, uh, takes place in the city. Uh, from there, in Chapter 2, and again, we're going to be going kind of on a quick little montage here, and you can see how it's how it's separated uh, with all of these different chapters or their own little subheadings. Um, one bummer is we don't get a whole lot of actual player handouts in this adventure versus some other adventures, uh, which is any kind of like art thing that you can click on and then share to player. So the way Roll20 organizes it is the art is on the top, and then all of the information is under GM Notes, which means you could click this, show to players, and they'll just see this artwork right here, which this is actually the um, uh, the climax of the first chapter as you're trying to rescue uh, the person who was kidnapped. Um, this art is really, really good, and we basically only get one of these per chapter, and it's basically artwork of a scene that happened. And that's pretty much it. Like, you get a few handouts of, like, letters and things, but we're really lacking in a lot of the cool, like, immersive player handouts of, like, environments or monsters or that kind of thing. It's really disappointing. And uh, I, especially compared to a lot of Wizards of the Coast stuff where I, I might not really like their map style, but I do like all of the different artwork that we get that showcases and just helps immerse your players into that world. And there's not a whole lot of that here. Uh, let's see, chapter two, the players are tasked with retrieving a holy artifact uh, to help, I guess, against the recent ghoul incursions on the surface. Uh, the journey actually takes them north in uh, to where they have to go on a ship. Uh, and, or no, sorry, that's chapter three. I'm getting ahead of myself. Chapter two, they go north along the road. There's a whole lot of random encounters you can do, uh, which thankfully it's included at the bottom, but there is actually a better... I was initially miffed about the way the random encounters were designed because it was literally just a table and like, hey, here's some just bullshit random encounters. Uh, I don't like to see those, but thankfully uh, it includes a uh, table and description here where you can see there's this full D100 table of encounters by region, and then there's a much more expanded description of what exactly each one of these encounters means to where some of them are locations or people you can rescue or monsters or maybe it's some kind of complication i do appreciate that so that was nice to see it's, just, it's kind of hidden away down here at this appendix e there seems to be some kind of weird error with the roll 20 version though it starts at chul um which is not correct because it should start at there's basilisk behir and blood cultist so there's three missing and obviously it starts at like six to seven here so there's a little bit of a problem there uh, i don't know why we're missing the first couple entries on the table. Uh, anyway, so chapter two takes them north into the vampire-controlled lands of Krakova. Uh, they meet up the uh, with an archduke, which they have to escort this pain-in-the-ass guy for about half the uh, scenario, uh, and eventually have to sneak into a castle filled with undead ghost knights, which is a really cool... I'm actually... Chapter two is probably the weakest one because it's a whole lot of, like, overland travel, um, but I do think that this castle is a really cool kind of climactic dungeon crawl and uh, involves like a lot of stealth and scouting and there's a whole lot of just cool uh, creatures and all that so I think that's just a, a really neat location. It ends very well even if the overall chapter is I think the weakest in my opinion. Uh, chapter 3, the party journeys, that's the one they, uh, they journey farther north, they get on a boat and travel up to... God, I wish there was a world map of Midgard. This does not come with one. I, I keep wanting to show that map, but we don't actually get a freaking world map of Midgard, which is crazy because so much of this adventure is traveling across the world. Um, the closest we get is when we're already in... Uh, we've traveled north across the... whatever the strait is called. We go into a reverse cave. We find out there's going to be this unholy wedding between a vampire priest and a ghoul priest, which is supposed to unlock these new powers for the undead. Uh, so we travel north uh, to Holdramos, where there's basically like a bunch of Amazon Valkyries that they famously train up. There's a really cool system here where you get into a big feast 
uh, the Memorial Feast of Rangrid Iron Eyes, and there's a whole lot of tasks you can perform. And then the better you are at these tasks, you gain these grace points that you can then use whenever you're traveling with the Shield Maidens, and they activate on Initiative 20, and then you can spend these grace points to let them do uh, different things. So it's a really cool system. I thought that was a neat way of rewarding players for role-playing well and making good skill checks. And then also running these like little army of NPCs and letting the players then perform the actions. I thought that was all really, really clever and a cool way of including all of that. It eventually culminates into trying to find where this uh, unholy marriage is taking place. You go through this really creepy undead like dwarven city with a bunch of... They're not zombies, but they're not alive. So it's just like they're following you around. And if you're mean to them, then they coalesce into this giant like swarm of uh, undead dwarves. But if you're not mean to them, you eventually like accrue exhaustion and they start like bugging you and talking to you. It's a really creepy, very thematic area. Unfortunately, there's no real maps for that because it's just kind of all situational and it does it doesn't come with any random encounter maps or anything like that either so you kind of have to come up with your own for all of that stuff and then eventually culminates in the midnight temple where you uh thwart the actual wedding and a lot of this is you know as you can tell there's a beginning middle and end to all of these individual chapters you're literally given a task at the beginning and then you know the end usually involves some kind of grand big battle with a boss so I like that design because it makes every chapter feel very flavorful and allows the players to have these multiple boss fights throughout. But the way some of these are connected are a little bit complicated because, at least in this one, you know, the chapter one, you discover the stuff. Chapter two, you know, you're fighting undead stuff in the vampire region. Chapter three, you're at least at the end of chapter three, you're finally dealing with the uh, a vampire and, and ghoul wedding. Uh, Chapter 4 is the one where I, I like Chapter 4 by itself, but in terms of fitting to the overall plot, it really is a giant side quest. Because at the end of Chapter 3, you find out that that Archduke that you are escorting gets uh, captured by the ghouls, so you have to go underground to the Underworld. That's the whole name of the thing. We're going to the Underworld. But before we do that, we get to spend an entire chapter teleporting to this desert necropolis down in uh, Seawall. And deal and, and learn basically how to disguise ourselves as Derakul so we will not be just completely attacked on site or enslaved or something when we're down there. Um, and it really is just one big like side quest. Like you're down in that city, you're dealing with their problems, they've got their own like undead ghoul has risen, and it's very much a classic like you gotta go down to this ancient tomb and stop this like mummy, basically. Uh, it's really the first time uh, that we have a huge, lengthy dungeon crawl, too. And you're, we're, like, I think 7th level by now. If you don't count that castle, which is, you know, it's kind of a, a sneaky siege thing. This one really feels like an appropriate, like, dungeon with traps and all that. Which is the, uh, what is this one called? Uh, the Catacombs. I guess they're just called the Catacombs Beneath. Uh, catacombs of the Ghoul King. That's what it's called. Which is the first real dungeon crawl in Chapter 4. Uh, chapter 5, we've got the Book of the Dead, so we can disguise ourselves as ghouls, so we finally go to the Underworld, and now shit starts getting really interesting to me. So, you know, beforehand, these first four chapters offer a fun tour of Midgard. Chapter 1 is all in the city of Zobek, which is, I think, one of those big cities that you can do a lot of adventuring in. Chapter 2 is all in this region north of Zobek, which is the... Uh, a lot of vampire-occupied cities and, fort and forts and things. Chapter 3 is that whole northern region with the Frost and the Shield Maidens and this undwarf, the undead dwarf city. And then Chapter 4, you're teleported down to the desert, which is thousands of miles to the south. It's a huge map. And then dealing with all of this threat. And then Chapter 5, we finally go Underworld. So it's, it's a real kind of whiplash in terms of where we're going and what we're doing, which is both a positive and a negative. You know, the fun thing is we're getting to do a lot of interesting places, and each chapter has its own very distinct theme. The negative is, when are we going to get to the fireworks factory? You know, when are we going to get to the Underworld and actually deal with these ghoul politics and all these things that the DM is probably excited about? Well, not till Chapter 5. Um, chapter 5... Also feels a little side questy because our whole goal is to, you know, ostensibly our goal is still to rescue the Archduke who was kidnapped back at the end of Chapter 3. And we learn in Chapter 5 the best way to do that is to ally with a former ghoul king who was deposed by, like, several emperors ago but is still kicking it around. So that part's kind of neat. Uh, and we're starting to get into, the, like, the politics of the things. 
but we still don't actually make it to the to the actual ghoul empire city until chapter six although chapter five has got some cool moments you're fighting that big uh, achug in the pit of flesh we can show that map for a second we don't actually get the pit of flesh we get the outpost which is kind of above and around the pit of flesh but i think it's a really cool looking map anyway uh, you can see here's the token problem rearing its head. We don't get vampires. We don't get ghouls. We only get specific cobalt press stuff like the Derek ghouls and the Imperial ghouls. Um, there's a dragon graveyard where you got to hunt down uh, the staff that the uh, ghoul king wants you to find. That's a neat little location there. So there's some cool stuff going on. Chapter 6 uh, includes a really crazy dungeon at the bottom of this uh, island first with some chained angels uh, next to I me, mean, this is where you start getting some cool tier three stuff, and you can really do some cool dungeons. Look at that! I mean, this map is really gorgeous looking, and there's this cool portal into this realm where you jump to, and it's just a the whole realm is just a bunch of like corpse eating worms that slowly eat at you. And there's this giant monstrous purple worm that can pop out. It's a really friggin' cool scenario. I really love this whole area, and then the actual city, which is primarily where Chapter Six takes place, the Pure City. And this is a really, really cool final chapter because it's like finally we get to the actual like urban adventuring stuff, which we haven't really done since chapter one. And even then, it's not a whole lot of chapter one, you know, you're level one. Whereas here, the final chapter is where we're actually going to do all the urban adventuring stuff. And there's a lot of cool stuff going on. There's like former, uh, you know, seditious generals and captains you can meet with to try to ally with them. Uh, and eventually you probably get captured most likely by, you know, the empire who's found you out. And then one of the empire's agents comes to you, the emperor, and says, hey, the emperor is not behind any of this. We're actually looking for some rogue, like the, the leader of this city specifically is behind all this. So we would like to hire you as a kind of an outside source to just tear this down so that we're not even involved. Which is, I think, a really cool twist. Because the whole time you think it's the empire is all united and coming up there. But no, it's just these wackos within the ghoul community within the actual empire are planning all of this to, to grow stronger and try to overthrow the empire and then wreak havoc on the surface world so i thought that was a really cool story twist chapter six is honestly just really really cool it's a bummer that we just bury so much of this until the very end there's just a lot of cool stuff going on here that i really enjoyed and it eventually um culminates in a battle in the bone cathedral where you've got the uh the archduke being lowered into that cavern of uh, lowered into a pile of worms who slowly devours him and he gets transformed into a dark cool or hopefully not hopefully you can stop that there's a whole bunch of bosses that you've been dealing with or only heard about and you have to fight and then at the very end the emperor actually shows up and everybody kneels you know after you fought everybody and then the emperor's like all right thank you for your service now get the fuck out of here before you know me and my people get hungry so i think it's a cool it's a cool chapter it's a cool end it's just a little bit of a bummer that a lot of what we were hoping to see throughout the campaign is saved until the very last, like, sixth of it is uh, the only unfortunate part. So that's Empire of the Ghouls. Um, let's also go over the uh, Underworld Layers, kind of as a quick addendum. Again, that's this is can be purchased separately for $18.99 on the Roll20 Marketplace or is included in the... Empire of the Ghouls complete bundle. And these are add-ons, so you can add them individually, one at a time, all 14 of them if you wanted to. I've added three of them to this dungeon, which is uh, Bastion of the Deranged, Breaching Worm Citadel, and the Cathedral of 10,000 Flames. And it just adds these little, it kind of adds them at the end awkwardly. with their. And each of them have their own monster stat blocks because you can purchase this separately as its own thing. So whenever you add them in there, it'll add... Another little subheading that says Underworld Layers, colon, whatever it is. Since I added multiples and included them all in here, which I don't know if that's a bug or, or not or what's going on there, but I included all three under this subheading. And then it adds notes about what each of these are for. You can see the levels range from third level at the easiest one at the Sanguine Lodge all the way up to the last Dwarven, Dwarven Readout, which is at 15th level character. So that's a pretty good range there. Um, don't expect much in terms of story or adventure. But I would expect some good-looking maps, which is what you're going to get. This one is almost embarrassing with how much it uses generic creatures, which means it looks like this with the tokens, so that's unfortunate. But the map, the actual map, is really good-looking. And frankly, this is what you're buying the Underworld layers for. You're buying it for the maps. 14 maps 
for less than 20 bucks, I think that's a solid deal. If you're actually going to run them as is, that's even better because you've got all the tokens in place. But if you're not, you know, you've still got the dynamic lighting in place and they're still just good looking maps. You could drop this in. Most of them are going to be designed as like caves or uh, dark, uh, you know, evil places. They've all got that kind of theme. This is one of the more exotic ones, which is the Breaching Worm Citadel. This map is actually a lich layer carved out of a petrified purple worm. And you can see we get the cool, like, uh, cutaway map right here that shows all the different rooms. And then the way it's designed is just kind of modular with all of these rooms connected to themselves, which I thought that was uh, really nifty. There's really not a whole lot of, like, twists and turns. They're very straightforward. I mean, you can't really tell an adventure within a single dungeon, and this one doesn't even really try. And the adventure hooks, again, are extremely lame. They're like, you know, hey, you've, you've heard about bad things happening over here. Go check it out. You know, it doesn't even try to include a whole lot of, like, role-playing or things like that. They are very combat heavy dungeons but again i think you're purchasing these for the nice looking maps and if you can include some of these tokens and monsters then uh great if not you still got the maps and then here's the cathedral of Ten Thousand sons uh which is so the darrow layer was fourth level that lich layer the uh, worm citadel was 14th level and then this cathedral is a sixth level sixth level uh vampire layer which, again, I think they're just really cool-looking maps. I love the eerie green here. Everything's glowing appropriately. Here's the dynamic lighting. You see all of these lights have their own, like, glowing radius. All that looks good. So I would honestly give a thumbs up to the Underworld layers. Um, the weird thing is it's included in the bundle for Empire of the Ghouls. I don't know how often you would actually want to use any of these dungeons in that campaign because so much of the campaign are tied to different locations that aren't the underworld. You know, I mean, maybe you could put this cathedral somewhere, but I like that petrified worm one. And, and the campaign ends at 12th level anyway. So if you're thinking, oh, these are, these are good supplements for the Empire of the Ghouls campaign, I'm not so sure about that. I, I mean, I th maybe you could include some of those in there, but I think you'd be pretty hard-pressed. Instead, it might actually be easier to make this a separate purchase or, you know, including the bundle, whatever, and actually add this onto other campaigns you were running in which you could take advantage of uh, all of these things. Or, hey, you can use the map, and like I said, you can delete all the tokens and put whatever the hell you want in there. But if you're if you're thinking that these all make for good supplements in Empire of the Ghouls, because Empire of the Ghouls actually only takes place in the underworld at the very end, uh, which would be levels like 9 through 12, I'm not sure if that's if that's actually going to work. All right, you've made it this far. Let's go over my pros, cons, and final verdict for Empire of the Ghouls. Pros, the individual chapters are designed as complete adventures. I do like that approach. It gives a nice little beginning, middle, and end to all those different areas. It really explores the different tiers of play. Yes, it does create a lot of very obvious linearity, but I think that's the trade-off you kind of have to accept if you're going to do that approach. Uh, pros, the campaign provides an encompassing tour of Cobalt Press's fantasy world of Midgard from the frosty mountains of Hundrumos to the desert necropolis of Seawall, which is not what I was expecting. Pros, high quality, full color, properly scaled battle maps look so good on virtual tabletops. Thank you so much to Cobalt Press for actually providing good, usable maps. Uh, pros, the Underworld Layers feature 14 drop-in dungeons with maps, tokens, and dynamic lighting. For any Roll20 campaign, I was thumbs up on the Underworld Layers. And thumbs up to the Underworld Player's Guide, adding several monstrous but thematically appropriate classes and subclasses. On the other side, the Cons, you probably know them already, uh, lacks token art for any creature originally found in the 5e Monster Manual, which is a significant number of them, although there are some workarounds. Uh, cons, only the final two chapters actually take place in the Underworld, with the final chapter finally delving into the Ghoul Empire. Just so much of this was hyped to be this big... I mean, the title of it is Empire of the Ghouls, and that's a cool selling point. I think that's a very unique quality to Midgard, and it's a bummer that we have to wait so long to actually get there. Cons, very few art handouts for players. As I mentioned, you here's like the one section right here, and they're all kind of, you know, notes. Um... And then when you get that, like, one picture per chapter, which is very disappointing. Uh, and then con, no rollable tables. 
which is something that Roll20 has been doing a lot of lately. They provide rollable tables for, like, like for example, random encounters would be a table you could just click on and click the roll button, it would roll it. I don't know why that's not here. It's kind of a weird, uh, a weird oversight. We don't get any rollable tables. Disappointed. Final verdict. While the OGL hurts the token art presentation on Roll20, Empire of the Ghouls effectively whisks players around Cobalt Press's fantasy world of Midgard. Thank you to everyone for watching this video review. You can see my written review at roguewatson.com. You can support my work at patreon.com slash roguewatson. You can follow our own D&D adventures here on my YouTube channel. Thank you.